Hello, it is such a pleasure to meet you, but you just said that we might have met before. I think that you've traveled the art world and I can't place you, but since I live in the belly of the beast of the thing, I may have seen you. Were you there? Was I there? I was there. I, I um, was at MoMA for eight years and Guggenheim two years before that and frequented many of the galleries, a lot of the exhibitions that you reference in your te uh, text I've, I've been to, and they hold a very special place in my heart. So I wouldn't be surprised, but um, this, is, this is an absolute honor to do this with you. And just thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. And I'm fangirling a little bit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I love that because I live alone in my office here and uh, I think, eh. Nobody knows what I'm writing. I'm just writing. Oh, that is so not true. That is so not true. You you are epic, Jerry. And I cannot tell you how excited I was when um, this was presented to us, Art is Life, because um, I do own your previous book, uh, How to Be an Artist. And that is just a wonderful title on how to create and survive within the art world. And so then when I saw this and I, I read that it was a collection of your essays and your writings, your criticisms, your thoughts, I just like jumped at the chance and, you know, here we are on a podcast. <laughs> thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here, honestly. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So th this book, I feel like I've been waiting for for a very long time. I've, I've read your critiques and your essays for gosh, like at least a decade, probably closer to two decades. And to have it in one beautiful package that is so well thought and curated is just so important and wonderful. How did this start? What inspired you to publish this collection of essays? Well, after the uh, How to Be an Artist book came out, my editor and publisher over at Riverhead and I were talking and we realized that this was a period of enormous change. Um, I first got my first big art criticism job, as uh, your listeners may or may not know, not until I was well into my 40s. I had not begun writing until I was about 40, having been a long-distance truck driver, the only Jewish one, I think. I never drove an 18-wheeler, but we'll get into all this later, but I became an art critic very late. So as big a loser as you are listening to this podcast, I promise you I was a bigger loser. I, I win the loser game. So I got my first job at the Village Voice in 1998 and stayed uh, for about 10 years and then went to New York Magazine. But what Art is Life really is, is my accidental, absolute, privileged front row seat, what turned out to be perhaps the greatest period of change that I have ever seen in the art world, and I'm now 71, and that I frankly think that has taken place in the art world since the advent of modernism, that everything came into question and much of it collapsed around us. At the same moment, art history is actually being rewritten. We are writing our stories to the world as opposed to just reading the old stories. And somehow, some way, accidentally, intentionally, desperately, on the case and caught off guard, art is life, captures this huge sweep and ends where about we are now in the present, which is an epic place as well. So that's what we did. We put this story together. It is a sort of epic of our criticism, if such a thing can exist, <laughs> and as annoying as that may sound. 
No, it doesn't sound annoying at all. And I, I totally agree that the last couple of decades of art in the art market, art museums, galleries, everything that you talk about in this book was exploded and then rewritten. And I think that's what's so special about this is that you do piece together and document a time of which we hadn't seen in yeah. forever. It's just brilliant. <laughs> it's sort of the good, the bad, the very bad. I cover the real highs, like um, Carl Walker unveiling this yeah. gigantic, enormous sphinx out in a Brooklyn sugar warehouse, then being destroyed yeah. now in a gentrified neighborhood. All of that is part of that context of an Aunt Jemima-like naked sphinx made out of sugar that almost the whole country saw. Mm -hmm. But from that high, of sort of from that sublime to the sort of madness of the growth of the mega gallery, of every question being answered with the same answer of, let's get bigger, let's get more. And of course, the not tragic, but ever present backdrop of money on the one hand mm -hmm. and politics. So you have this mad alchemical mit, mix, if you will, of both uh, uh, the profane and the sacred. That is, the politics came from earnestness. Of course, as Oscar Wilde said, all bad poetry is sincere. So a lot of the political art that I write about is not that great, you might think. I try to write about the political work that it is great without the wall label. I'm not interested in uh, a great art that is only on the wall label. Like you read this huge thing and you go, this is about this protest or that. And then you look at the work and it's a picture and I have wrote about this, of a black and white picture of clouds over Ferguson, Missouri. And I went, this is terrible political art. It's barely art at all. Yeah. So we, I cover sort of from the sacred of that, of artists trying to affect change in whatever way possible, and against this enormous backdrop of the most successful artists making obscene amounts of money and at the height of the trump era we invented a new masterpiece in the art world and it was called the salvador mundi by leonardo da vinci it was exhibited at a christie's auction house um, in a contemporary art auction i was lucky enough to be let in to see it with the crowds and i you know, shouldered my elbowed my way to the front of the painting. There were guards all around me. Selfies were being taken. I looked at the painting and I had a terrible thought in my eyes and brain. And I heard myself think, this painting is dead. This painting is actually not alive the way even mediocre uh, old master paintings are alive. I have no degrees. I never went to school, and when I wrote about this painting to the world to say that I did not think it was real, I told everybody, don't listen to me, because I'm not an art historian. I am self-taught. Of course, I think all of us are self-taught. It's all try and trial and error. It's all hit and miss. We all woke up this morning thinking, that's it. I'm kind of empty. Uh, I got nothing new to say, or I'm a fake, or whatever. But I realized that nothing about this painting looked like an actual Leonardo da Vinci on the one hand, and I, with my idiot skills, which are zero, looked up where did this painting live for the last 500 years. You have to realize that Leonardo da Vinci was the most famous artist alive at his time. He was in Florence when he painted it with a young upstart artist named Michelangelo, <laughs> who had Never just made <laughs> a little thing called the David. 
And this older artist who everyone loved knew that a new God had arrived in the art world. And this was competition. It was such competition, in fact, that Leonardo voted, let's not put the David on public view. It could get damage, you know, <laughs> classic artist um, envy. So about the year he was doing that, he would never have painted a conventional painting like this on the one hand. And finally, the provenance is completely non-existent. Mm -hmm. I wrote that the painting was a fake. It ended up on national news. It's in a movie. And everybody said I was an idiot, which was possible. Uh, they sold the painting to a sheik, and the painting now lives on a yacht, has disappeared. No museum will show it. And it turns out, and again, I did not know what I was talking about. Again, it turns out I was probably right, that at best, somebody touched the painting. That's yet another from the heights to the depths that's covered in this um, incredible story. Yes, it, it really is an incredible story. And specifically that piece, um, I remember reading in your book that supposedly maybe 90% of it was touched up. So yes. a part of me reading that, I was like, <laughs> perhaps this was just like a general sketch that got <laughs> blown out of proportion. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it, it, it's it's so interesting how the art market blows up for these these insane names and there there's a quote in your book that i just think is one of the best quotes i've ever read about the art market consumption becomes a sort of sacrament with the art playing the role of sacrificial lamb as the ponzi scheme surrounding it all rolls in what's out of whack at the auctions however is not just isn't just the monetary values of art it's the values of the people who are buying and selling it that just rings so true. That's what happened in that period where wealthy people thought they could be president, that they could run Twitter, that they could enter art history by spending the most amount of money. When the truth is, and there's nothing wrong with money, I want money. Yeah. <laughs> All of us wake up going, I deserve another room in this apartment. Right. But the truth about money is that it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with quality. Mm -hmm. It is true that much great art is very expensive, and that's fine with me. The problem in our period is with all of this wealth rushing in to buy that rightfully or obscenely uh, expensive art is that no museum can afford it anymore. No. So what this means is these auctions are actual, actually a celebration, and that term sacrificial lamb enters here, where the work is paraded on view for four lousy days. You can't see a thing. Again, it's fun to be around wealthy people taking pictures of themselves with masterpieces. But on the fourth day, the painting goes in a room in the public with a, a vaguely exotic European accented beautiful man or woman gesturing like this, <laughs> you know, do I have 30 million dollars? 40? What will I have? And the funny thing is people applaud the price, but not the work. The point being that this is the last time this painting will ever be seen in your lifetime. Think for a second if their lie turned out to be true, that this was a Leonardo, and it disappears for another lifetime. That's what happens to these paintings. So when you read and cheer on these auctions, know on the first hand, the artist isn't getting a goddamn dime. So all those artists you think are getting rich, they may be rich, ridiculously, and our job is to envy them daily, <laughs> and I'd like to say I do, uh, but at auction, they make nothing, mm -hmm. and nobody sees the painting again until the wealthy person brings it under hammer again. But the point is, this is only 1% of the 1% of the art world. The rest of the 99%, which you know, because you lived 
and loved and have a life lived in this art world, the rest of the 99% isn't part of that 155 mostly uh, super wealthy white male artists, Mm -hmm. the 1,500 collectors, and that giant molecule. All the rest of us are having these lives lived in art. And that's this backdrop that I would argue in the end was a beautiful smokescreen for something tremendous happening. At the same time as this massive octopus uh, squid black ink smoke screen had been jetted into the water by the wealthy that blinded the wealthy so that people only bought what other people like them had already been buying. At the same time, modernism was collapsing, meaning not that Picasso's no good anymore. For God's (laughs) sake, if you start putting Picasso in the basement, I don't even know that I'm going back to MoMA. (laughs) <laughs> modernism was great mm-hmm. but modernism as we told the story was an arrow of one ism maleism usually uh being created to destroy the previous one that was bad daddy bigot issues him who bigot him. <laughs> yes an authority figure killing no it's amazing and then every 10 years they claim painting is dead mm-hmm. i've made the last painting The novel is dead. The author is dead. Poetry can't exist after Auschwitz. And I wrote back then saying, when you say that after Auschwitz, there is no poetry, the very expression is poetic. Art has been around a long, long time before we were here. I think it's possibly a cosmic force using us to self-replicate, but let's not go there. And that during this smokescreen, art was able to regroup and say modernism, again, is only telling about 15% of the story. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you and I are living in a time where more women, more artists of color, more disabled, more every whip stitch minority artist in the world, including you. I'm an illegal Estonian immigrant. My father came to this country illegal. I am an Estonian anchor baby. That I, they wanted to kick me out. But even my uh, uh, people are getting shows now. And here's the thing about that. All of you listening will be going, hmm, yes, this is great, but Jerry... All this mediocre is getting mediocre art is getting through. And what I want to say to you all is that that's true. There is a lot of mediocre work now being made by women, Hispanic men, uh, Ecuadorian, Estonian immigrants, okay? Or Estonian art critics. However, this has never not been the case. No. Uh, mediocre white male artists have always gotten through. There's an artist named Sean Scully. I'll only punch up. He's very <laughs> famous. The paintings are stripes or blurry grids. I don't know. They're beautiful. <laughs> he shows in every museum. The paintings sell, like I say, for a million bucks. But he's mediocre. Yeah. And so I would also add that about 85% of all the art we all see is not that good. However, of the art that was being made in the Renaissance was not that good. We've just never seen it. We just see what has been preserved, what is accessible to the public through museums and galleries, history. That's true. And to follow on your point, go to the greatest museum in the world, go to the Prado the Met, whatever your home museum is, and I should say go there four times a year at least, <laughs> with no plan to see anything, just wander until a painting does this to you. You there. I saw you look at me. Yeah. I saw you out of the corner of your eye. Come closer. Keep looking Come at closer. <laughs> you love me. I could change your life. Go to a museum with that bizarre stuff in mind, (laughs) and you will notice that you're walking past 85% of even the world's 
masterpieces where you go mm-hmm. kind of brown, mm-hmm. pretty Not brown. <laughs> and my job in art is life is to try to make the scary, mysterious, ultra elite now practice be as accessible to you as Mozart, Mm -hmm. as Abba, as music, as the best film, that there is a way to talk about art. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that I do it that is not so defensive that it's couched in jargon like, well, the late commodified object of the simulacra finding itself embedded in a post-Marxist environment, (laughs) uh, blah, blah, blah. And you put down these things and you go, what the hell are you talking about? And And then we all think you should. absorb a bit of it. Not a bit. I I so anyway, I'm trying to write. Do you know who Sister Wendy was? Yes. She was a nun that had a, a television series as when I was young about uh, the history of art. And I remember thinking, if I ever do anything, that's how I want to be. So I consider myself something of a, a glockenspiel in the orchestra of art criticism, but a Sister Wendy Bob Ross, because I'm a late bloomer, because I started as an artist and demons spoke to me, the same demons that spoke to you at 3.15 a.m. this morning. And I stopped making art and I became a self-exile and loser living in terrible conditions, never an addict, but everything short of that, okay? I want to write to the person I was like, you've got a shot. I can give you a second and a third chance. You're not just stuck in Ozark, you know, a redneck art person, meaning you never had a shot. My, I want to open doors. If you don't like me, I'm fine. I used to be on all the fancy schmancy art world top 100 lists. And I write about this in The Art is Life. And I think this is important to hear that I would be in the Power 100 and I would always pretend when people said, wow, Jerry, you're in the Power 100. I would go, really? I hadn't noticed. Oh, that's nice. But secretly, I thought I'm one of the Power 100. I was breathing my own fumes. At the same time, in the early 2000s, some kid put an app on my computer or phone or something called Facebook. And I started posting pictures of art that I was seeing and saying what I didn't like and what I did like. And the first time I did that happened to be about a painter named Marlene Dumas, a well-known Dutch painter who paints kind of blurry realist paintings of um, women, children, uh, trauma. And I wrote why I didn't like the work. And about 500 people, uh, instead of just saying, oh, I'm glad you're having a nice morning, you know, on your status, 500 people got on and tore me a new one. And within one second, I had a revelation. And this was what it was. Instead of art criticism, the model that I was trying to move into and become good at, which yet seemed corrupt to me, the model of art criticism that I entered was a pyramid that is the one critic writing to the rest of the audience. Mm -hmm. This accidental post told me in an instant that instead of the one speaking to the many, I, on social media, as embarrassing as it could be, could have the one speak to one another on a more or less equal playing field and that I made two rules on the first day, and that I've still lived by. You may call me any name you wish. I have rhinoceros skin. I don't know why, but uh, you can say anything to me because I always think two things. You could be right, and you could never say anything worse about me that I've not said to myself in the, um, at 3.15 a.m., okay? While I'm hurt by it, I won't be stopped or defined by it. 
But the rule is you may call me a name, but you may call no one else in this thread a name because I noticed that that's when chaos ensued. And the other is cynics make me sleepy. I, so I block them. Cynics are people who think they know things. Oh, I know why he's got a show or she's getting a show or who this one boinked or mm -hmm. why that one has a trust fund. And my answer is all of our lives, our private lives can never be known to anybody. And you don't know the crap we're all going through, the traumas that brought us all here that I don't think I'm not interested in knowers, what D.H. Lawrence called a knower. If you think you know it, I'm not interested in what you know. I'm interested in what we want to find out. In 2007, to get back to this thing without ruining this podcast completely, <laughs> because no one talks to critics, we just sit alone. Um, I was like number 54 on the top 100 list ahead of Jasper Johns, which is already an absurdity. And only the wealthy people and their advertisers are the top 50, which, mm -hmm. hello, <laughs> they warned me in public, in the magazine. They said, Jerry Saltz, blah, blah. But if he keeps practicing art criticism on social media, he will find himself with no power at all. That is just so absurd. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I feel real good when I'm talking to other people about art. And I didn't stop, and I never was on another list again. And to this day, when I look at the list, I sneak a peek to see if I'm on, and I've never been on again. And you know what? It's fine. I don't belong on those lists. I'm not that interested in that game. It bores me, and I love watching it, however. You were rejected for using social media, but social media is so far-reaching, and you're able to share your criticism, your ideas, your opinions with so many more people. So I find it really interesting that the game hasn't yet accepted social media as a key player, as a key format of communication. I think that you're right. Mm -hmm. However, it is complicated because every idiot, including me most prominently, thinks that she or he has something important to say. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, social media, I think it took apart one of the gatekeepers that I can, I posted artists on my weirdo Instagram, just saying good morning from, and mm -hmm. I liked, I used to post like 10 a morning and then 10 every night of artists that I would see on Instagram names I've never heard. I'm a hashtag archeologist. So I would go to your page and go, She's pretty good, but I don't want to post that mm -hmm. and see who you like, because I trusted your eye just enough. And then I see who you liked. And I like that person who liked this person. And this whole process takes all of eight seconds. And then on the 10th second, I might have said, good morning from Jane Doe. The only thing I looked for in the work is not if it was great or terrible, or if, even if I liked it, but if it seemed convincing that if it seemed in play in this moment, an art of this moment that people might want to see and use, steal from whatever for their own DNA. So I would post a lot of art and some of those artists went on to become very well known. I have mm -hmm. still never met them and good for them. I've posted a lot of much better artists that nobody ever has paid attention to. The final point on the thing being, that a lot of what we see isn't that good on social media, but that, again, is no different from going to Chelsea. 85% of it's kind of meh. But what's beautiful is the 15% that we disagree on, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's where I live in that sweet spot. Or not me, because I don't go out. My second self is a very happy a well-adjusted person who makes weird sounds on Instagram. So I hope you all follow it. Instagram is a game changer, but there's still a beautiful game of art world, galleries. I love galleries. That's the love of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's the main subject covered in art is life. That means galleries are where new art happens. It is. Good art bad art 
Mm -hmm. My job is to notice things and to say what I notice. I'm doing that in an era, however, where criticism changed. Everyone wrote positive reviews. And it's not possible that every, th every movie is good or every meal is good or everything that the uh, New York Jets do is good. That's absurd. Or every outfit you tried on last night to wear today was good. But suddenly in the art, 99.9% .9 of all criticism was positive. I remember then, and I had already been doing it, I thought, I can't do that. Because for me, I want my work to be radically vulnerable, as radically vulnerable as I think artists are in their work, meaning I have to say what I think. And when I'm thinking something in front of your work, your book, your poem, your film, your meal, well, I wouldn't do it at dinner, but I need to, I hear things I don't want to hear, like what I don't like. And my job is to say what I noticed what I like about it and why, what I didn't like about it and why, what made this one better than that one, in what part of um, John, you know, convention, are you using convention or is convention using you? And so I just wrote that way. And I think that's how I want the art world to be like a great podcast or phone conversation where it's at least that interesting. You can't. And also emotional. And emotional. Like when we don't like something, we're going to fight for and against and all of that. We're all criticism now, most likes everything. And I just don't buy it. I don't buy that that's the truth. So, anyway, this covers that the good, the bad, and the very bad mm -hmm. in the trenches of the gallery as the one art world cracked, rotted and slowly gave way and finally went dark in March 19th, 2020, when COVID shut down the world. My last book was published two days before. <laughs> I lost a 45-day book tour. Um, oh, no. The book made the New York Times and LA Times bestseller list, but I missed all the fun. I hope I have fun on this one. Please buy this damn book. I want to take selfies with you. I want to sign your book. I want to talk about art. Yeah, but, and we want that. And But I do think it is almost kind of kismet in a way that your book was released two days before the pandemic struck because with so many things being shut down and so so much being in disarray, I personally know a lot of artists that blossomed in that period that the only thing that gave them any solace was creating. On the other hand, I also make art, but I couldn't make anything at that time because I was just too emotionally distraught. But yeah. the, the, the fact that how to be an artist was there for people. It's interesting that you mention that because in many ways, the creative life is not that different than lockdown life. And that this was just an amplified version of that but in its most beautiful, in the beginning, outside of death, I'm not interested in people saying I had a good COVID, but we are talking about something we all pass through, the billions of us together at the same time. Art returned to its most archaic point where we were making art out of whatever was at hand, whatever was in the room, in whatever way we could, and much more important, connecting us to our roots, mm -hmm. was that the studio, the kitchen, the living room, the kids' Zoom classes, where Nana is in the back, like falling off the chair or walking the dog. The studio became the pharmacy, the kitchen, the bedroom, the office, the playroom, the schoolroom, the way our species lived for 50,000 years. Mm -hmm. And we did pretty good. I Incredibly would argue that the, yeah. the cave paintings are arguably the greatest renditions of mammals that our species have, has ever created. So that was the first pandemic and the art world shut down. 
Then there was the second pandemic with George Floyd. And where everybody had been inside pandemic, this pandemic went outside. And everyone flowed on the streets with an incredible pent-up thing of saying, it's time. It's time. It's true. The art world had even talked the talk, but had not walked the walk. And that is what art is life tracks, that Mm -hmm. yes, we are radical, liberal, progressive. There's... we're good people, good little human. Like, <laughs> but it was time to change the system itself. Yeah. And that is what changed in these last three years, where art history itself is being rewritten. What is being shown is being rewritten by who, how it's seen. Other narratives are taking the stage. Doesn't matter that not all of them are great. No, but that George Floyd event was the dam breaking. Mm -hmm. The first COVID thing was seeing all the cracks in the dam that had been there. I'm not a Republican, but 50% probably of all collectors are. Many of the most rich collectors are on Trump's uh, election committees. How does the art world square that? My only Early answer is a Laurie Anderson song, Superman, oh Superman. And that she says, This is the hand, the hand that takes, that we want justice. So, right now, I'm going to go with that. Yes, we're taking highly questionable people's money, but maybe, just maybe, we can make enough dents in this wall that the art world is not part of an aesthetic apartheid any longer. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that people like you and I have to go? Well, it sure means that we have to get more other people in our jobs. And I always say to people, someday I will be gone. I'm going to be writing and working as hard as I can to try to earn this incredibly lucky position I've got to be watching and recording this entire world, which is what art is life is, that when my day comes, I will have been incredibly lucky. I had an incredible run. The change has only just begun. It's happening now. Everybody is a part of it. The stakes are high and it's kind of thrilling. And it's brought us full circle to what art is, which is life. That yes, it's structure and form, and formalism, and the incredible breakthroughs the last 250 years brought on by, you know, pre-modernism, modernism, modernism, post-modernism. Post-modernism might have just been a terrible Freudian daddy struggle where they couldn't talk about anything without talking about the father modernism. Mm -hmm. The author couldn't be dead, in other words, because there were new authors on the stage. Women authors, look what's happened in the last 50 years of it's women's amazing. novels, or again, uh, uh, writers of color. It, mm-hmm. The game's changed. It hasn't gotten worse. You haven't ruined art history. It's telling more of the story. That's what a- I'm interested in, not the arrow, yeah. but the cloud. No. Yeah. And and so much of it has been hidden for such a long time. It's It's really thrilling to be able to go to a museum and see a faith ring gold right next to a Picasso. Bingo. I just went back yesterday. Yeah. To to see that rehang faith ring gold. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're being cued audience is a <laughs> um, about an 80 year old black woman artist whose painting was hung across the, the room from the number one painting in all of modernism. Picasso's Demoiselle de Avignon, which means the five horrors of Avignon Street. And they're the ones, like, suppose, like this Mm -hmm. and like that. And they're looking directly at you with one of the most intense gazes in the history of all paintings, saying, We mean business. If you're here to talk and think, this is not the room for you. This Mm -hmm. is carnal knowledge of the body. Art is life means that the biographies told 
the lives that have become the material of this art are in play and embedded in the art that you are seeing. Not the wall label, but their narratives of discontinuity rather than continuity, interrupted lives. Mm -hmm. The blues told this incredible story of men who had no choice and they left. But think about the women who stayed at home and kept a world together and made a new blues of their own literatures, art like Faith Ringgold in tapestry, embroidery. When you stay at home, you are creating revolutions too. Mm -hmm. That is what this period has told us, that it's not always the white male romantic death trip of I will go as far as I can go, burn in an effigy of I have Reden made so, the best painting that has ever been created. <laughs> yes, there's no best painting. There's no. favorite paintings. Sure. So like you say, much more of the story is going to be told and many more people will be writing the story of those stories. And that's mm -hmm. amazing. And our museums better get the sticks out of their butts and catch up. Yes, the wheel it's is true. still in spin. <laughs> How do you feel that museums are faring with this change to thought of art history? Some of them are playing catch up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's okay. We're all playing catch up. When change comes, you either, you have a choice. You play catch up yeah. to the change or you don't. That's fine with me. That's all the teachers in your schools that always say to you, it's been done before. And then you always ask them, when was the last time art was good? And they always go, oh, when I was young. So them, don't listen to. They have good things to teach you, but I will be honest with you. These museums, again, have about 50% of Republicans on their boards, and museums were in front of this curve. Before the change came, I'm going to give them full credit. They saw that their collections were telling a lie. A great story, but like you said, only part of the story, they told a lie. And they have been buying like mad to try to catch up. Mm -hmm. Of course, they've bought a lot of mediocre work that will never be seen again. But the truth is, they're doing great. MoMA has the hardest story to tell because they're te nobody has a collection like MoMA. Museums are rising to the task. Mm -hmm. I would only say to curators, don't be dictators. Don't tell us how to think and what to feel. We all feel the same in this world of PTSD. Art is life, is the story of the last 25 years of art, none of which was made under normal conditions. No. So we all feel the PTSD and the thrill. The truth is, if I said, would you go back 900 years and live in that timeline as a woman, for example, you would have no rights. You would never leave your house nope. ever. Not mm -hmm. once. Would you go back to that timeline or live in this? So before you complain about this time, oh, everything's crap. I would say, no, you wouldn't leave this time. You no, might want to make it better. You would never leave this time. <laughs> no. Look at what would happen to an Estonian fat immigrant like me overweight. I'm trying to get on this. Um, point being, curators, just show the work that's in the galleries. You do not have to fly to upper Estonia and find the one artist who's washing a, a, a monochrome canvas in the Black Sea because her parents might have been deported from there. Mm -hmm. Show good work. Mm -hmm. Man, have I bored everybody? Well, <laughs> No, you haven't bored anyone <laughs> at all. This has just been fantastic. Thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> of course, of course. Now, um, I really felt like when I was reading this book, I wish I had something similar when I was in school and I was studying arts history and theory because you focus on such important people, works, movements. It's really quite special. Where did you go to school? Hitzer College in sure. California. Yeah. And what do you feel that you didn't get? I felt that I got one side of the story for the most part. Art history, 
as much as I loved it and I did a lot of the research on my own, I did not like what they were teaching in class. <laughs> That's why you are so great at what you do. <laughs> I had to find a, a different way about it. You know, you had to find your own tribe. Yeah. Find the your bad artists that you thought were good mm -hmm. and try to make other losers like me believe you. And we help change the story. And your generation is being tasked with the most beautiful thing in the world, the one that my generation in the 1980s was tasked with. We were tasked and we succeeded at building an art world. Mm -hmm. You are tasked. There's this huge, empty city of skyscrapers that we didn't do the best construction on. And you will now not only fix them, you will build new ones and occupy the old ones. And I know from people like you, everybody's up to the task. Everybody. Yeah. It's happening. And that's what art is life tells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that it does. Well, just thank you so much, Jerry. This has been such a pleasure. <laughs> thank you for hearing me out. Oh my gosh, no. Um, th this has been absolutely wonderful. And if I do happen to meet you at some point, which I hope I do, and one of the chapters in the book, you talked about Robert Gober, um, The Heart is a Metaphor, which was one of my favorite exhibitions when I was at MoMA. I have an extra book that he signed, and I would like to give it to you. <laughs> oh, you're breaking my heart. No. <laughs> He's a great artist. And I want all the readers to, uh, or listeners to know, first of all, if you see me in public, mm -hmm. I'm going to sound like I'm bragging. Okay. But I'm going to just tell you the truth. I'm lucky as this idiot sister, Wendy, two or three people stop me every day on the street and go, are you? And I go, it's me. <laughs> and we walk for a block or two talking about art. We'll take a selfie and it's wonderful. And anybody that wants me to come to your school, your museum, if you build it, I will come because we need to talk about this. We need to feel our antenna together. So you better say hi when you see me out there in the galleries. Definitely. And I think everyone will. <laughs> everyone should. I hope should. so. We're all lonely. <laughs> we are. We're all alone. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, I just, this was, this was an absolute pleasure to read and um, I can't say enough good things about it. And just thank you. And also thank you for, my <laughs> month. <laughs> oh, thank you. No. Thank but also I, I just want to throw out there too, is that there are so many wonderful little anecdotes in this book that just give a little glimpse into your life like when um when you were talking about the the wrist exhibition at MoMA and how you got to turn it off for the last time that was beautiful like they had this huge video installation yeah. I went like a bazillion times mm -hmm. fell in love with the thing and they said would you like to be the one to turn it off and they let me do it and it was astounding Th that is just <laughs> I can't even imagine what that felt like. It was intense. It's, yeah. Because I'm me, but I never feel like me mm -hmm. the way right now. Nobody actually when anyway, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They think I'm Jerry Saltz, the art critic, where inside I'm Jerry Saltz, the excited 40 year old that can't believe he got a third chance out of sight of the long distance trucks. I got to dance with Jay-Z. And I don't know what I'm doing. And I, while we danced, I said out loud in this videotape, the artists that you're praising aren't that great. He had like <laughs> George Kondo. And then the yeah. art world got upset. But I've oh. been very lucky. Like all of us, we know that. Yeah, we do. Thank you so much, Jerry. Talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a good one. Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Art is Life by Jerry Saltz. I'm Mark and I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm joined by my book buddy Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Mark. I'm Jamie. I am coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Leawood, Kansas. Wonderful. States apart, but our book brains meld very nicely together. So I'm excited for this episode. Uh, Jamie, do you want to jump right in with your recommendation? Yeah, absolutely. Great, go for um, it. 
I was reading Jerry Saltz, and these are smart essays, right, on modern art. And uh, I was just reminded of a book that came out a few years ago called Ninth Street Women by Mary Gab- Gabriel. Ah, so good. It is a good one. Uh, it's right here. It's a nice big book. Uh, it is the story of five female artists who are working in New York in the middle of the last century, right? The 1940s, 1950s. And there are names here that you're going to recognize. You've got Lee Krasner, who was famously married to Jackson Pollock, Grace Hardigan, Helen Frankenthaler, Elaine de Kooning, and Joan Mitchell. Mm. And all five are abstract expressionist painters. Gabriel brings them really to vivid life in this biography. Um, These ladies are not Betty Draper. (laughs) (laughs) They are not your typical, you know, 1950s housewife, what you think of stereotypically, right? These are plugged in, passionate women. They're amazingly talented and they're breaking through barriers. Um, They're doing all this while they're struggling to pay the heating bill. Uh, They're fighting through infidelity in their relationships, living and working with each other um, while completely just tearing apart the rules of art. And at a time when the spotlight had really moved from um, art in Europe as the center of art to um, to shine on America, they're really gutsy women, right? They're brought to life in this book. And so it it could be dry, it could be academic or stuffy, but it's not. It's a fun book. It's gossipy. It is overflowing with interviews and stuffed with photographs. And of course, there's gorgeous art for you to look at inside as well. So five biographies in one mark. That counts Uh, as five for me. I think that's, (laughs) uh, yeah. So your boxes are ticked. That's absolutely perfect. Uh, Nine Street Women is tremendous. Nice choice. As expected. I chose one that's a little bit more of like a, I I call it a tiny coffee table book. Um, It's one that you can open to any page and you'll get a a nice little slice. And that is The Secret Lives of Color. Um, That's by Cassia St. Clair. It's a real charmer. Um, This is a title that should basically live in every creative person's home, if not anybody who's just interested and curious about art and life and history. The author has essentially uncovered the history and culture behind 75 different shades and hues. Each has their own fascinating story. You get to read about the decision behind the specific red used for the Ferrari. You get to read about the ridiculously intricate and expensive means to create the most vibrant hue of blue. Uh, And all sorts of wonderful, colorful info nuggets. I just feel like this is a fantastic gift for yourself. It's a fantastic gift for anybody in your home. Like I said, it's a tiny coffee table book. You can pop open to any page and just get a nice little slice of info. um, And it just enriches your view on the world of art in general, um, just from a fun, kind of adorable perspective. So please check out The Secret Lives of Color. And that's Cassia St. Clair. Married to a artist and graphic designer. And um, yes, so I love to learn about color and the choices that he gets to make. And that is a favorite book to recommend. To oh, customers. absolutely. <laughs> oh, it's such a good pick. Ah, I love it. I love it. That is all we have. Thank you so much for tuning into Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark, and you can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie, and you can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thanks, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.